Julian Sarni in Singapore, thank you so much. We've seen investors running for the hills in a number of areas, and today we are asking the question on MLIV, when will the dip buyers emerge to halt this route? You can join the debate, reach out to us and the MLIV team, IB plus TV Go on your Bloomberg, and we'll be putting that question to our guest host this hour as well. But now let's get the Bloomberg First World News with Deborah Mao, also in Hong Kong. Hi, Deborah. Nera, the U.S. has accused China of continuing a state-backed campaign of intellectual property and technology theft. The new accusations come in a detailed 53-page report released by the U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer's office just 10 days before Trump is due to meet Xi on the sidelines of the G20 summit. The timing of the report appears to be a move by more hawkish members of Trump's administration to bolster their case ahead of the summit as other cabinet members push for a resumption of trade negotiations. UK Prime Minister Theresa May heads to Brussels later for more talks on the draft Brexit deal she's agreed with the EU. She's been told there can be no more negotiations, but her critics back home are demanding that she secures a better arrangement. May will meet with European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker this evening ahead of a special summit of EU leaders in Brussels on Sunday. A European Commission report due out this morning could say that Italy's 2019 budget is in breach of EU fiscal rules, raising the threat of fines on the country. Yesterday saw Italy's bond market under pressure as domestic investors gave a lukewarm reception to a sale of inflation-linked debt. Today's EU report could presage the start of proceedings leading to a fine of up to 0.2% of Italy's 1.7 trillion euro annual economic output. President Donald Trump says he won't let the murder of U.S. based columnist Jamal Khashoggi jeopardize relations with Saudi Arabia. In a statement headlined America First, Trump said he would stand by Saudi Arabia regardless of whether Trump sends Mohammed bin Salman or Mr. Khashoggi's death. The president's comments drew a swift backlash from Republicans and Democrats in Congress who have for weeks decried the murder and the Crown Prince's alleged involvement. Because it's America first for me. It's all about America first. We're not going to give up hundreds of billions of dollars in orders and let Russia, China, and everybody else have them. It's all about, for me, very simple. It's America first. President Xi's visit to the Philippines has already yielded a string of deals as the Duterte administration shrugs off U.S. warnings of accepting Chinese cash. The trip reflects warmer ties between Manila and Beijing, which began when Duterte took office and moved the Philippines away from the long-standing uh, American alliance. And the deals include joint oil and gas exploration in the South China Sea. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Thank you so much. Now, it was one of the worst single session losses since 2015, with simmering weakness across assets boiling over yesterday to leave investors with virtually nowhere to hide. U.S. stocks buckled for a second day, sending the S&P 500 careering toward a correction. Asian stocks are following on today, with markets resuming declines. Meanwhile, oil plunged 6% to depths last seen a year ago, and Bitcoin is in free foil. And not to mention, uh, not to forget, of course, that credit cracks also so seem to be widening investment grade spreads at a two-year high. Joining us now is Ewan Murray, head of investment at Hermes. Ewan, great to have you. A stomach churning day in markets, cross asset yesterday, and I've got a great chart that actually sums it up here, showing that there's nowhere to hide. Almost nothing has worked in 2018 for investors, according to this chart. And actually, uh, it really does show how over the past year it's been bad, not just in the most recent month. There still seems to be no panic, though, according to some measures, and I'm referring specifically to the ARMS, or the ARMS Index, which kind of uh, compares the NICE Composite Index's advanced decline breadth and uh, advancing declining volume. That suggests that there is still a little bit of complacency in the markets. Are we yet to see true catharsis in these markets? Yes, we are, Nair. I don't think we're at the point of complete capitulation yet. The memories of the summer, G G GDP growth in the States hitting 4%, incredible earnings numbers, etc., are still there. And investors seem very reluctant at this point to shrug them off. Right. So let's 
bring the MLIV question in then. You say that there's still further selling to go here. The MLIV question of the day is, when will the dip buyers emerge to halt this route? It's a great question. One of my colleagues yesterday said to me that he thought the blood was in the waters of the equity markets and the sharps are beginning to circle. I love the analogy. I thought it's probably yeah. true. It does feel to me as though that buy the dip has gone away and instead that there's a, an inclination possibly to start selling rallies instead, which really is a complete reversal for everything that we've seen so far for the last several years. Yeah, and what's been interesting as well is that a lot of the pain has been happening cross markets, but also you haven't really seen gold rising. You haven't seen the 10-year Treasury yield drop as much as you might expect with such a sell-off in equities and also the strains that we've been seeing in the credit market. So is there anywhere to hide? Well, indeed, I think that's the case. So we, the, the Treasury markets have moved, but not by as much as you'd expect. The yields have fallen a little bit. Um, we've also seen carnage in the commodities markets and oil as well. Again, it's very difficult to know, uh, you know where to go. Is, I think we have to go back to 1996 to find a year in which cash beats both equities and bonds. Now, we've been talking in a lot of our stories about the fact that this year is turning out to be one of the most difficult for investing since the early 1970s. I'm not saying you were investing in the early 1970s, Yoan, but nonetheless, does it feel like that now? Because you have nonetheless been in, in this in this line of work for a long time. Yes, so I, I can't quite recall the 1970s, I'm sure I was doing something. Um, but it wasn't long after that I was in the markets. Right. Um, we've, we've, been in, we've been in these situations before where we've seen several uh, you know, uh, strong declines or uh, dislocations in markets. And uh, you know, I'm not going to say that history will repeat, but of course we know that it rhymes. Okay, it rhymes doesn't necessarily repeat. Low correlation bear market is what JP Morgan has called this. Is there one asset class that you look to for a stronger signal on market direction than others at this point? Yes, it's going to be the credit markets for right. me for a, for a direction forward. They do have that tendency to lead equities for the vulnerabilities to really become apparent in credit markets first. So I'm still watching them. Great. Luckily, we'll be talking a lot more about credit markets just a little bit later. But for the meantime, how do you actually approach asset allocation when there are several what some people have called idiosyncratic risks all happening at the same time? In other words, a perfect storm of one-off forces. So my short answer is, with difficulty, is yeah. how you approach asset allocation. The longer answer is, um, if you have the patience and have long-term capital behind you, then opportunities will come from dislocation. And I think that's the best way to view markets at the moment. It would be very, very disingenuous for me to sit here and suggest knee-jerk reactions, selling equities, where do you go, government bonds, possibly not into the credit markets. There's too much risk uh, around at the moment, too much noise. I'm looking for more information just yet. Okay, but what part of the information is it crucial for you to get right now? Is it your call on global growth or something else? So global growth still looks relatively, well, at least US growth still looks relatively strong. So what we're really looking for, I think, here is where's the convert, what's the direction of convergence going to be? Is the US going to come down to the rest of the world, or is the rest of the world going to find some stimulus from somewhere that's going to allow it to catch back up again? So that's the key question that you think you need to get right? I think so for now. And do you have an answer to that? No, I wish I did. Right, okay. <laughs> Let's talk about tech, because this is something crucial to discuss as well. And actually, I've been scratching my head a little bit over the most recent sell-off because it didn't seem like there was any specific new news. Um, yes, uh, there have been a number of concerns about Apple, but for, the, for it to fall into a bear market over the past couple of days and for the rest of the tech market to be hit as well, I, it left me scratching my head a little bit. So let me just ask you simply first, what's behind the most recent sell-off in tech? So I think what has been going on in the rest of the market, the sort of rolling bear market across sectors, has finally caught up with the tech sector, and in particular, the fangs. Mm. They have been market leaders all year, whether on the up, and now they are simply catching up with the rest of the market on the way down. Okay, catching up. Do they have further to fall? Potentially, yes. I think there are still sufficient uncertainties, particularly around the regulatory noise following recent revelations around Facebook and so on. Yeah, also I guess what's made it more difficult is hedge funds turned net sellers against this month. Hedge fund exposure actually hovering at its lowest relative to the market since December 2015. So, you know, the question is whether you want to sort of chase that fast money or whether you want to take a different view. But if the sell-off is not down to something specific and you're a bull, a long-term bull on tech stocks, does it make it more difficult to have that bullish view if those sell-offs come out of nowhere? 
I think it does. It certainly makes it, yeah, it makes it more difficult to hold on to it and for that conviction to remain as strong. Um, as you said, the, the Apple story in particular has been a curious one. You know, does it signal that we're at peak phone, uh, peak smartphone in some way? Can they, you know, is it true that there are, there's nobody else to buy phones out there? It's a tough call. Tough call, a lot of tough calls to make in these markets. Ewan Murray, head of investment at Hermes, stays with us. And coming up, corporate credit cracks. It's set to be the worst year for credit since the global financial crisis. We'll ask where the pain will fall for investors. This is Bloomberg. Interactive Brokers pays 1.68% on US dollars in your brokerage account. your broker pays most banks or brokers pay nothing or less than a quarter of one percent move your account to interactive brokers and start earning interest as global temperatures rise extreme weather events are getting worse every year one solution is to harness the power of hydrogen Hyundai Fusel Electric Vehicle Free Running Air Purifier Natural Chain contributes to environmental protection because this vehicle is a carbon free. Hydrogen fuel cell systems will have a huge impact on creating a better quality of life and a better planet. The next arena for us is really double down and double down uh, exposure on our customer experience. Um, we want you to feel good about flying United Airlines. And to that end, we've got many, many initiatives that are built up, but it's all about you, the customer. Our business it depends on free trade, and we're a big believer that uh, economies are best served by having open, free, and fair trade. So I think anytime you start to put restrictions on that, it has an impact on our business.
Hey, Nara, the Apple's at chairman says he's not confident Google will be better off bringing a censored search engine to China, a key goal of CEO Sundar Pichai. Google pulled out of mainland China in 2010 when founders Sergey Brin and Larry Page decided that censorship was unacceptable. Chairman John Hennessy told Bloomberg it's a dilemma for any company wanting to operate in China. Anybody who does business in China uh, compromises some of their core values, every single company, uh, because the laws in China are quite a bit different than they are in our own country. The question that I think comes to my mind and that I struggle with is, are we better off uh, giving Chinese citizens a decent search engine, a capable search engine, even if it is uh, restricted and censored in some cases, than a search engine that's, that's not very good? Uh, and does that improve the quality of their lives? And that's the struggle we have to we have to work our way through. Mark Zuckerberg says he's standing by Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg as they face criticism over the social network's handling of recent scandal. Facebook stock has plunged almost 40 percent since its July peak amid claims it's compromised users' privacy and helped undermine democracies. Zuckerberg told CNN he has no plans to step down as chairman and also indicated Sandberg's position is secure. Cheryl is a really important part of this company and is leading a lot of the efforts to address a lot of the biggest efforts that uh, the, the biggest issues that we have. And she's been an important partner for me for um, 10 years. And you know, I'm really proud of the work that we've done together. And I, I hope that we work together for decades more to come. And the Washington Post is reporting that NASA has ordered a safety review into the two companies it's hired to fly astronauts to the International Space Station. Citing sources, the Post says the review was prompted by the recent behavior of SpaceX founder Elon Musk after he took a hit of marijuana and sipped whiskey on a podcast streamed on the Internet. That's said to have rankled some at NASA's highest levels. Uh, and that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Thank you so much, Deborah Mao in Hong Kong. Now, the cracks in the credit market are widening as investors face their fears about the mountains of debt weighing on corporate America. If pressure began building last month, things blew up last week. High-grade bond spreads widened the most in two years. Premiums paid for junk bonds jumped the most in almost two years. And the prices of leveraged loans sank to the lowest since 2016. Investment-grade bonds are already on track for their worst year in terms of total returns in a decade. To dig deeper, Bloomberg's Tassos Vassos joins us now. He's been following this story all year, and Ewan Murray, head of investment at Hermes, is still with us as well. Tassos, great to have you. Big fan of your work. So let's start with the first key question, which is why have things gotten so bad now for corporate debt? Well, there was a risk that we knew we had to deal with at the start of the year. That was the end of the QE era, quantitative easing, and moving on to quantitative tightening. Um, so people had already started looking at uh, life after QE, but risks have started to mount ever since then. In Europe, for example, we had political issues in Italy, and now with Brexit, we had uh, jitters in the emerging markets um, back in, in the summer. And in the last two months, we've seen a return of what we haven't seen in several years in the investment grain market. And that's the return of idiosyncratic risk. That's like risks related to specific names or specific sectors. Right. So in terms of the different areas of the corporate bond market, you've mentioned investment grade. Of course, we can talk junk bonds, uh, also leverage loans. What's done better and what's done worse? Or has this just been a sell-off across the board? Well, it's been a sell-off across the board as we had a nice chart yesterday um, yeah. titled Red Wave. Uh, and there's been differences between markets, of course, uh, for several different reasons. Uh, one reason is the um, difference on, on default risk that you see, mostly in junk bonds, where you see the, the, the most bonds cratering over there. Uh, in the investment grade market, and particularly in the US, you've had the extra way or weight of um, arising uh, treasury yields, which mm -hmm. is um, weight on, uh, weighted on um, total returns. This is something we haven't seen yet in Europe, but neither in the euro market nor the sterling market. So in a way that minimizes the risks there, but spreads have widened across the board. That's something we can't really dispute. And is there much difference between what's been happening in the US and what's been happening in Europe and in the sterling market that you've just sort of hinted at there? It's, it's mostly about what's happening in the underlying rates market. Right. Something that affects total return, but we seem to have to be dealing with the same risks at the end of the day. That's the end of central bank support, uh, especially in Europe. We're going to have the you know, European Central Bank 
ending its net asset purchases at the end of the year, which has been a massive support to the market over the past two years. We're talking about 175 billion euros of purchases. But if you look at spreads right now, uh, if you look at the chart, you'll see that we are at, at the level of where back in 2016 in March. This is when the ECB first announced the program. So the market has, you could claim that we've started already pricing this out. So we are going into next year on our own, trying to find a new level, a new equilibrium for the market. So that's going to be quite difficult for us. Yeah, when Quincy Crosby, Prudential Chief Market Strategist, said that often the credit market acts as a signal, but this time the credit market could be taking the cue from the equity market. Given what you said earlier, would you disagree with that? Yeah, I would. I think um, that my expectation is that the credit markets usually are the lead. Uh, I think, as Tassa says, there were signals earlier this year they weren't entirely priced in. We've known for a while credit markets have grown immeasurably, two, over two and a half times. We know that the, quality, the average quality in the investment grade space has dropped. We know that covenant light issuance is rife. There are lots of problems there that we've known about for a while. Is there anywhere that you would be taking opportunity? I've got a chart here. There's so many charts to show. Of course, Tassos mentioned a few, but this is just showing high yield spreads reaching the highest level since December 2016 this month. I've seen a couple of people say that really it's st they're starting to get attractive at this point. And also the leverage loan market hasn't performed as badly as the rest. So are there any opportunities, perhaps in high yield leverage loans that you would be looking at? There will be opportunities there, and I've no doubt but some returns will come from there. I still think, particularly the leveraged loan market, is, is one of the riskier parts of the market for the time being. Uh, the covenant there, covenants there are some of the weakest that I have seen. Many of those loans are then getting packaged into CLOs and sold off with much higher ratings. That, for me, is a bit of a warning signal that I'm watching a bit more closely. Thank you so much, both of you. Tassos Bassos, Bloomberg Credit Reporter, and Ewan Murray, Head of Investment at Hermes, staying with us. Now, up next, we'll discuss the latest on the gold scandal and how his arrest is impacting the Nissan-Renault relationship. Can the alliance survive this shock arrest? And when you're traveling to work, tune into Bloomberg Radio, live on your mobile device, or on DAB Digital Radio in the London area. Stay with us wherever you are. This is Bloomberg. politics finally breaks the car on Wall Street. An IP just coming through from a terminal user. Are we seeing signs of complacency in the Treasury market?
let's take a look at the world map and see how the markets are performing across Asia. A lot of red you're seeing there on your screen. The equity sell-off continuing in the Asian markets, even though the MSCI Asia Pacific Index has bounced a little bit off its lows. Now let's check in on the markets around the world. And joining us from our Bloomberg Quint partner in Mumbai is Niraj Shah. And here in London is Bloomberg's Amory Hord. Uh, Niraj, good to see you. Indian equity markets had opened relatively unscathed in comparison to the U.S. market drop. How's it looking right now? Yeah, Nera, uh, good morning to you, and yes, you are right. We started off very well, but somehow, uh, I think when the U.S. sneezes, the world catches a cold, and I think that's true for Indian markets as well, because we've now come back, to come off to the lowest point of the day. So about a percent lower today, about a percent lower yesterday, and this is despite the crude markets doing very well. The money markets are shut today, but uh, crude coming off has not provided that long-term respite in today's session. So we are at the lowest point of the day, and almost all the key indices are trading with a fair bit of red on the screen. I must tell you, though, and the alternative, which is the crude price fall, has brought about some positive reactions in the oil and gas index and the oil and gas related names. So that index is up about half a percent. And save for Reliance Industries, which naturally would react the way it has, almost everything else is doing very well. So the oil marketing companies like Indian Oil Corporation and the others, or the aviation companies are doing really well for itself. And the pharma company on your screen, Dr. Eddie's, won that case against Imidior, and that's led to this stock do doing well. But all in all, a lot of pressure on the Indian markets today. You mentioned oil, Niraj, Amri. Of course, we saw that plunge of more than 6% in WTI yesterday, and oil is rebounding a little bit today. I'm guessing that tells us something about volatility. We need to look at the price of bread. Possibly, near it could be on the risk of falling below $60 a barrel for the first time in more than a year. But as you say, volatility of WTI, that's what I'm looking at. It's the highest in almost two years, since February 2016. A lot of factors at play here that what's going on into the oil market. We, of course, have the, uh, the global sell-off. We have trade tensions escalating. Um, as, on top of that, we also have a debate on whether or not OPEC and friends could agree on production cuts. And adding production cuts and adding to the latest um, risk and pressure on the market is the U.S. president. He is saying that Saudi Arabia has been quote responsive to any requests for lower oil prices. So all these factors are adding into the volatility. And then moving on, I want to take a little trip down memory lane. Nara, where were you in 1998? Because I'm looking at the dot com bubble versus where we are today in emerging markets. And you can see tech stocks in emerging markets have really put pressure, and the sell-off of them have really put pressure on the broader MSCI EM index. And in white, that's what we have from present day. Since 2017 till now, this is as the index has reacted. In blue is the MSCI EM index from 1998 to 2001. Now, Nara, don't they look remarkably parallel? <laughs> yes, they do. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie Hordern, for us in London, and Bloomberg Quince and Niraj Shah for us in Mumbai for our roundup of the markets across the world. And of course, today we are asking the question on MLIV. Given the sell-off and the pain we saw in markets yesterday, when will the dip buyers emerge to halt this route? You can join the debate. Reach out to us and the MLIV team, IB plus TV Go, on your Bloomberg. Now let's get the Bloomberg First Word news with Desley Humphrey in Dubai. Hi, Desley. Hey, Naira. The U.S. has accused China of continuing a state-backed campaign of intellectual property and technology theft. The new accusations come in a detailed 53-page report released by U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer's office just 10 days before Trump is due to meet Xi on the sidelines of the G20 summit. The timing of the report appears to be a move by more hawkish members of Trump's administration to bolster their case ahead of the summit as other cabinet members push for a resumption of trade negotiations. UK Prime Minister Theresa May heads to Brussels later for more talks on the draft Brexit deal she's agreed with the EU. She's been told there can be no more negotiations, but her critics back home are demanding she secure a better arrangement. May will meet with European Commissioner President Jean-Claude Juncker this evening ahead of a special summit of EU leaders in Brussels on Sunday. The European Commission report due out this morning could say that Italy's 2019 budget is in breach of EU fiscal rules, raising the threat of fines.